באמת אלוף מוטי אלמוז, תודה רבה ש... Brigadier General Moti El Mous, thank you for granting this interview. I want to begin by talking about your experiences, everything you experienced in the IDF from then until now. Can we really say that the IDF in which you enlisted is the same IDF we see today? To a very large degree, yes. The nucleus is the fact that the IDF is the heart of the State of Israel, that all eyes are on it, the fact that every family has some sort of connection to the military. This is exactly what was when I enlisted. But a lot of other aspects have changed completely. And the fact that uh, today soldiers are on social media all day, the fact that parents worry and it sometimes gets the better of them, and they do things which involve them with the military. The media, when I enlisted, we didn't really know what it was. It was far less critical, it wasn't in its current dimensions. And I think that as regards everything to do with military matters, weaponry capabilities, there have been significant changes. You say this, and it takes me back to a conversation I had with the commander of NATO forces in Afghanistan. When we discussed this point of soldiers who go in and fight and get killed and how this is perceived here, he said this is a soldier's work. If he loses his life, it's his work. That is, we are ready for this, we know this, the British forces, and it's different. It's different in the military. Each and every soldier here has significance because it's a people's army. Is this something which you think can change? This British approach of a man goes to battle, he goes to die, versus that of a man goes into battle, he goes to fight and not to die. I think in Israel it will not change. I think in Israel there are not so many other options. The military is in this position that Israel has faced security problems for years and always worries from the security point of view and ensures that it is ready for the next conflict. I think the loss of each soldier, we are in close contact with other armies. Just yesterday, I discussed this topic with others. We find it difficult to explain to foreign armies what we mean by the price we pay. Foreign armies don't really understand that we get together, that everyone stops, that we learn our heritage, and that we carry out lots of remembrance services. We grew up with this. It's something unique to Israel. I think that if there is something which has not changed over the years, you can correct me if I'm wrong, perhaps I'm mistaken, it's the idea that the Israeli military is the most powerful in the world. The question is whether, judging by the past wars, it remains the most powerful in the world, or is it just one of other powerful armies in our region? I'm thinking you know what I'm getting at. In this region, we are very powerful. I think the behavior of our enemies shows this, all their analyses. I think that if they thought differently, they would do other things very easily. But overall, one week ago, the general staff of the IDF was at Yad Vashem, and we met Israel's ninth president, Shimon Peres. And he told us, look, the fact is that since the War of Independence, this army has not lost a war. I think we are in a good position as regards Israel's military strength. If you talk about defeats and victories, we do not call the operations in Gaza wars, so as not to reach a situation where Israel does not emerge with the upper hand? I think we need to deal with Israel's security problems. And the question of use of force also depends on its timing. We need to be careful in using force and very sharp when we decide to use it. Eight months after Operation Protective Edge, the children's house in Karam Shalom is overflowing. And you see the situation in the communities around every Israeli border. And you understand that despite the security situation, this country knows how to live. 
The automatic freezing of money transfers to the Palestinian influences the security coordination with the Palestinian Authority. There are situations where you see what takes place on the political level, and you see. You know what takes place in the field, and you say to yourself, wow, that was a wrong call. We were on the verge of a flare-up in the West Bank in recent weeks, and it didn't happen because it feels as if someone came along and gave a slap and pounded on the table and said, guys, transfer the funds. Look, this question of almost a flare-up. We've been living it for many years. And let's be honest, all big events in the West Bank were events with the potential to flare up. There were no events when we knew that on this day or on that day the flare up will happen. Now the political echelon, which is busy with diplomatic issues and has a wide range of considerations to take into account. Sometimes it has its own considerations, and in a democratic and in a democratic country, that's just fine. But we remember where we are. You'll hear no criticism of the political echelon from me. Everything connected to the political echelon we say in the rooms there, and it's perfectly legitimate to handle it this way. Now this feeling that someone pounded the table, I think it's factually incorrect, because everyone understands the significance of the welfare of the Palestinian citizen and Palestinian life. We have no interest in destroying Palestinian society. I think the Palestinians know this. Does Israel need to worry and go into action? Because let me put it this way. Benjamin Netanyahu said there is an Islamic State and an Islamic Republic. That's what we are looking at now. And that's what it appears. No borders, everyone murdering everyone else. And Israel is seeing all this. I do not think there's another country which opened a hospital opposite an enemy state which wants its destruction and treated this country's citizens who are caught in a conflict which has nothing to do with Israel. The question, as always, is how far do we go and for how long? Is it right for the IDF to enter Damascus, set up a hospital, take its tanks and make some order. As far as Israel's interests go, this is exaggerated. I don't think it's right for Israel to take such a significant step in getting involved. We look on these events with great sorrow. And how important are, let's say, the new alliances or the options for new alliances which currently exist in the region? I hear suddenly that Israel has a better peace with Saudi Arabia than with Egypt. I hear Saudi Arabia more than I hear Egypt. I think we deal with our interests and our security problems with great responsibility. There is a temptation sometimes to intervene in all sorts of issues, perhaps because they will reach us. And the central question is, when do you use force and when is it right to intervene? I don't think it's in Israel's interest to decide what sort of regime would exist in this or that country. I think Israel should defend its borders. This is what the political echelon decided and this is what will be. I do not think there is an option for cooperation. I think that in everything connected to common interests, especially humanitarian, we need to find them and do what we can to save those people we can save. What do you wish for yourself and for the country in the coming year? For the country, a minimum of security problems, lots of activity and prosperity, a lot less disputes, for myself, that will talk only about good things. But uh, we're here in a different interview. I also want to wish you great success in what you do. I don't know if your viewers are aware that you are a symbol in Israel, officially on Independence Day. We are very happy that you are among the torchlighters at the Independence Day ceremony, a symbol of personal success and also of the opening of hearts, the definition of our country. Many, many, many thanks. Here's hoping this coming summer will be a lot quieter than last year's. Many, many thanks for this interview.